Hi, welcome to Convocations today. Thanks for being here. I am really thrilled to be able to introduce our speaker today, and I'm, I'm glad he can be here. Um, I want to make a couple of quick announcements, and then we'll, we'll get to our presentation today. So first of all, uh, remember at the end of every week that you come, there's a survey that in Canvas that you'll take. It just has um, some quick evaluation, you know, strongly agree, strongly uh, you know, neutral, those type of questions. Uh, after last week, there was a glitch with it for a couple hours. So if you haven't done last week, still you can do it. But the one this week, fingers crossed, is ready to go. It's, it's there. It was, we'll, we'll troubleshoot if we need to. Uh, and remember, you only need to do those for the weeks that you do come. Also, uh, we have uh, a variety of events that you can go to this semester for the cultural events. Uh, anything that's posted with signs in this building will be pre-approved, but we also have a calendar in Canvas that you can look at and you can see what events are, are pre-approved that you can go to and then just fill out the survey afterwards. To get to the calendar, you have to go to cultural events, the link on the main page, and then you can see the calendar. But can I ask a, just a show of hands, how many of you have seen that Google calendar in cultural events? Put your hands up high. Okay. Who has not been, is, has, is anyone not been able to find it? Okay, a couple hands. Uh, there might be a change. I'll talk with the TAs and the team, but we might even put it on the main page. So if anything, we'll, we'll make it even easier to find. But that, rather than giving you a long list in every weekly email, we're just putting all that information on a calendar where it's a little more user friendly. Uh, and then finally, just make sure you contact me if you have any questions about the class, if you have any um, presenters this semester that you'd like to come to lunch with, if you have any interest in Convocation Plus, which we're, we're getting up to speed a little bit, uh, anything that I can do to help you have a good experience in this class and to pass the class, those are really what I'd like to see happen. So. Uh, I'll be around afterwards if there are any questions or you can send me emails. But, so right now, if you'll just remember to turn off your cell phones. And I, uh, our speaker today is Shadman Bashir, and he's the Director of International Student Services and a former, former visiting professor of law and international relations at Dixie State University. And he teaches business and criminal law and war and terrorism global law. A native of the Pakistani tribal region, Bashir is an expert in South Asian law, politics, conflicts, and culture. He speaks six languages, impressive, uh, and multiple dialects. Uh, Bashir received a BA in political science from Edwards College and an LLB in English and Islamic law from the University of Peshawar, both in Pakistan. He then moved to the US and received an LLM in comparative law from California Western School of Law in San Diego. And he'll be talking today about Afghanistan, the never-ending wars. Would you please join me in welcoming Shabman Bashir. OK. Thank you very much. Is it on? on? OK. Um, as David mentioned, I'm from Dixie State. We have the same kind of an auditorium over there. It looks the same way. Um, I be very careful when I speak because when I'm at Dixie, I can say many creepy things. But because the students know me, or here you guys do not know me, if I make you uncomfortable, please in the end ask me why did I say something. So I was born and raised in northwestern regions, uh, tribal areas of Pakistan. I am not, and I always explain that I'm not an Afghanistan expert. And the reason I say it, because my approach towards certain topics is interdisciplinary. I always, when I come across a conflict, an issue, um, a situation, what I do, I try to step around it and try to look at it from multiple angles to try to understand it. And this is what I'm going to do um, with the lecture today. As David mentioned, I have law degrees and I have worked on global affairs. I um, teach war and terrorism, I teach global law, and the way I look at um, issues and topics like these, I try to understand decision-making and societies within two extremes. One is law, which is organized, and the other is war, which is chaos. And we as 
human society, we have evolved between these two extremes. And that's how I try to look at it. So Afghanistan, the endless war. Um, I wish uh, I could have, uh, when I am done with this lecture, you will have more questions regarding Afghanistan. Um, and I'll try my best to answer in the, a few of them in the allotted time. And if I can't, at least this will give you an understanding of why, what is Afghanistan and why we are where we are in that region today. So, um, Newsweek, Times, we will never save Afghanistan. The idea is that when we think of saving, we have parameters. When we go to war, we say, well, I'm going to go to war, and these are the conditions. If those are achieved, that will be victory. So before you start a war, you have to have certain parameters, certain conditions, which will define or identify victory. If you don't have that, you should never, ever go into a war like that. Because those wars are unwin unwinnable. So when we say we'll never save Afghanistan, save Afghanistan from what? That's the most important key. When we say, well, can we turn Afghanistan into a peaceful society? OK. Define peaceful society. Is it peaceful society the way it is in St. George, Utah? Or is it the way it was in Kabul in 1965 or 1970? or 2005. You have to have that answer first before you go into a war like that. The world is divided among weak states but strong societies, and strong states but weak societies. Uh, this means that in countries like Afghanistan, the government control or the government's monopoly over violence is weak. It's the power is within the tribes and with the people. This is why what we see. There is an Afghan central government. There is a president in Afghanistan. Does that president control Afghanistan the way the president in the United States or the president of Turkey or the president of Russia, they control it? No. Because we have to understand Afghan society is completely different than the way it is over here or many developed countries. This is the map of the world. Anytime I, I, I listen to arguments or talks about that, it's the developed and the developing world. It's the haves and the have-nots. It's the civilized and the uncivilized world. That's the way. Uh, you may or may not agree with these terms, but this is how generally the world is divided. How do I look at it? I always look at it as the sunny side up, like an egg. If you study colonialism, if you study the recent history, the last two, three hundred years, what you will see, colonizers, the British Empire, they controlled the yellow part. The white part was where there were the problems. Take the example of Yemen. Take the example of India, which was India, Pakistan together. Any of those regions, Saudi Arabia, the Turks controlled Saudi Arabia, First World War. But how were Turks defeated in the First World War? Because the tribes in the white area was where the Turks had less authority. So this is how the countries are divided and the world is divided. So for example, the Afghan president might control the yellow part, but he has no control or very limited control in the white part. But what do we see? The white part is the majority of Afghanistan. So when we think about Afghanistan, we think it should all be yellow. But it's not yellow. You have to see the yellow part is the tribes, uh, sorry, the white part is the tribes, the yellow part is the cities. And that's how it has always been. Earth at night, again, whenever you talk about a country, conflict, war, chaos, 
instability. The best way to find out what's happening, look at the map of Earth at night. Where there are more lights, there'll be more control. When there are less lights, this means it is away from development. And when, when it's away from development, what's happening? Population is increasing, chaos is increasing, instability is there. There are more people living inside this circle than outside of it. That's the area. That's where we see instability. Why is Afghanistan the way it is? What is so unique about Afghanistan? How come Afghanistan or the tribes we come from, they have so many tribes? How did those tribes develop? Why didn't we have tribes like that over here or many other countries? Imagine this area, does this has a laser light? I think I'm not sure, okay. The reason I draw this line, these are the mountains in the north and west of India. Throughout history, crossing these mountains was very difficult. Right above India is China. But Chinese and South Asian cultures never mixed. Why did they not mix? Because there was the wall, Himalayas. That's why there was the gap. And same is the case on the other side. So throughout history, if you wanted to go from European regions up north and back, you had to take this route. So Afghanistan was a path. If you're coming from European side of things or from Africa, this is where you go. And if you're coming from the top, this is how you go through. So what that has done, imagine Afghanistan as a place which is actually a road. Throughout, for the last thousands of years, people have moved through it. And this movement has created a society which is divided into tribes. And that's why those tribes have unique identities and geography. We are prisoners of geography. The terrain in Afghanistan, I think I might have the map of the terrain of Afghanistan. There'll be people who would have never left the valley in which they were born. They never decided, there's a mountain over there, let me cross this mountain. The mountain is maybe a mile from where they were born. They never did that. So what that has done is a strong sense of identity, relationship within that valley. When people ask me, how come Afghans or the tribesmen, the tribes, they never give up, there's nothing in that land. It's, it's barren, it's empty, nothing. Why? The mindset is different. These people do not fight for the living, or say just for the living, they fight for the dead. What does that mean? When you are born and raised, your tribe owns a place, what happens, there is a community graveyard. And in that graveyard, you have your ancestors buried. So when you have your ancestors buried somewhere in that place, that is your place. So you fight not only for the living, you fight for the dead. That totally changes the concept. And this wall, and I'm, I'm sorry, this, is a, this was supposed to be a, when I do this lecture, it's a one hour lecture, so I'm going through this very fast because time, we don't have that much time. So throughout history, through this wall, there were only two paths through which armies could go through. Alexander the Great went through Khyber Pass. Look at the terrain of Afghanistan. Terrain makes it so difficult to fight in Afghanistan. There's a very good book, it's called Learning to Eat Soup with a Knife. If anyone ever gets a chance, please read it if you want to understand Vietnam War. It's a comparative analysis of the Vietnam War and Malaya campaign. In Malaya campaign, the British were able to defeat insurgency within three years. In Vietnam, US could not defeat insurgency. Why? Because the British used the policing models. They adapted to the battlefield, to the terrain. When US went to Vietnam, 
they wanted the battlefield to adapt to what they had, to their tools. That is what is again happening in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is rightly called the graveyard of empires. Alexander the Great came in, the only way he could survive through this was through agreements. That's why there's so many cities which are not there anymore are named after him. The Mongols went in, the Mongols never wanted to stay in Afghanistan, they were just looting and they went through it. The British tried three times to capture Afghanistan, couldn't do it. The Russians go in, and now we have seen the longest war in American history taking place in Afghanistan. This is the tribal structure. So you have history, you have ethnicity, you have tribes, you have terrain. All of these things are giving you unique identities. And what does that identity mean? You fight for it. And when you fight for your identity, for example, for example, when we think about ethnic, imagine all of us, the population of Afghanistan, all of us. And all of us are divided into 20 different tribes, major tribes, and then sub-tribes. And we always keep on fighting among each other. So we are always battle-hardened. We do that, but the moment an external force comes in, we join. We fight the external force. When they are gone, we start fighting again. That is the pattern that has been happening, and that is what gave birth to the first Taliban. So ethnic divide, um, when we say Pashtuns, 42%, that's the majority. I am an ethnic Pashtun. That's why I'm always the random guy on the airports. Anytime I travel, they always stop me. They always want to ask me questions. I was coming back from uh, Pakistan in January 2010. They checked my luggage, and then they find, of all the books in the world, I brought a book which was called A to Z of Jihadi Groups in Pakistan. Of all the books in the world, and then the, and for the next three and a half hours, I was the most interesting person on San Francisco airport. So they were playing the good cop, bad cop, checking me, and asked me why was I reading that book. I was like, so that I can tell people not to do it. Not tell them to do it. But anyways, it, they were not buying it, so three and a half hours. Maybe it was my deadly good looks. They wanted to keep on touching me and everything. I was like, okay. If it makes you happy, what do I care? So anyways, so, I mean, I was getting free publicity in San Francisco, so that's it. Okay, so again, imagine tribes and then sub-tribes. And then on top of that, tribes are divided among multiple countries, which means you may be a tribesman, certain sub-tribe from Afghanistan. Your cousin is the same ethnic background, same mix, but he is from Pakistan. Now, if government is trying to catch you, you just walk over into that land. That's it. You're protected. So on top of that, it makes another problem where there's another country. So the orange is the Pashtuns. They are divided. If it's not more confusing, look at this image, which means, which means US military when they join hands with one tribe, this tribe will use the military might against their enemies, and back and forth. So loyalties are bought and sold like this, because enemy of my enemy is my friend. Let's make it even more confusing. This was the plan for victory in Afghanistan. I think this was presented to Gen General Stanley McChrystal and he was shown this slide, and he was told, this is how we can win the war in Afghanistan. And it's believed that he said, if we can understand this slide, we can win the war. First thing is, let's understand what it says. So no one could understand, but this was the strategy of defeating the war in Afghanistan. Now, what is the war in Afghanistan? Is it the war in Afghanistan or the wars in Afghanistan? When we say war, we are, we are not able to identify the problem. It's not war, it's wars. Four major kinds. 
war with the terrorists, war within the region, war within Afghanistan, and the global war. When I say the region, I mean that area, not the country itself. Let's look at the map of Afghanistan. For a second, imagine that Afghanistan is a pond, a water pond. I always have, always have a hard time saying water, water, water. OK, water, everyone got the, the, the thing we drink. Pond of this. I always, they're like, what did you say? I'm like, water. OK. So imagine it's a water pond. And there are multiple neighbors around it. And the backyards of all these neighbors are towards this pond. Backyards, which means the areas less developed. Some want this pond, some need this pond. Now again, two, wants and needs. And on top of that, everyone has their own favorable strategic outcome that they want to gain from Afghanistan. Which means, when US goes to war in Afghanistan, they have their own. We want to save Afghanistan. We want to bring peace to Afghanistan. That's one confusion. Imagine all of these countries. Each country needs their own favorable strategic outcome from Afghanistan. Are they all aligned together? No way. So this means all of them are fighting directly or indirectly in Afghanistan. It's a mess. Creates confusions. Lots of confusions. Again. When we look at the Afghan government, imagine the map of Afghanistan and then look at these small pockets. We can say that's where the government has control. Generally, we can presume. What's happening outside? That is beyond the government's control. No one could ever control that. Then the layers are building. We have wars, we have tribes, we have terrains, we have enemies, we have friends, we have history, all that stuff. Somewhere in between, there's a code. And the code is called Pashtun Wali. Pashtun, our people. There is no book for Pashtun Wali. It's an unwritten code. We, when we are born, you're four years old, you do something, you are reminded that you are a Pashtun. You have to follow that code. I'm like, where is the code? Where is the book? Can I see that? No. No one has the book. It's something that you follow all your life. This is one of the poems that I that can rightly um, explain on Pashtun Wali. I'll, I'll say it in Pashto, one of the language I speak. If you ask me with love, I'll go to hell with you. I don't care. But if you force it on me, I'm not going to even go to heaven. So, please, can you go into hell? Yes, but I'm going to drag you to heaven. No way. The mindset. I'm a red-blooded Pashtun. I understand what I'm doing. My honor, well, what is honor? Graves. Region. Your soil. Your earth. I'll take back my honor even if I have to lose my head for that. That is what sums Pashtun Wali. Throughout history, some old images, men, because they're tribes, always warriors. Because you're always supposed to be ready for conflict, not necessarily with outsiders, but within other tribes, within families. This goes on and on. So some of the old images. Come to the century, 18th century, there were four empires in that region. And when you see that, the British were controlling India, South Asia, and the Russian Empire was up north. Where was, what was Afghanistan's dilemma? It was stuck between them. So the British believed that the Russians would come through Afghanistan because they could not come from anywhere else because of the walls, Himalayas. They're going to come through Afghanistan and enter and control and capture the British territory. And India 
was the jewel in the crown. And the Russians believed that the British would go through Afghanistan up north because this is the path. So both these empires wanted to control that path, which means the great game. The great game was played, and a, a very nice um, cartoon depicting in the middle is the king or the Shah of Afghanistan. Save me from my friends. Because both of them were trying to be his friends, in fact, controlling Afghanistan. The British decided that it was too much. Let's go and capture Afghanistan. They did it three times. And every time, they lost. Classic scenario. The British were able to go in, capture the cities. Perfect. Remember how quick Kabul fell? How quick Baghdad fell? What happens after that? That's the tricky part. So British were able to go in. These are called Anglo-Afghan wars. Once they were in, they got stuck. The Russians were able to go in. How do you come out of Afghanistan? Going in is easy. Coming out is the problem. And um, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, Dr. Watson gets injured in the second Anglo-Afghan war. That's when he talks about his war experience. That's the second one. So again, another image shows Afghans fighting in, with primitive weapons, but fighting. Why does it become difficult to stay in Afghanistan? Because supply routes, prisoners of geography. When you have a garrison in Kabul, any foreign invader, you need constant supplies. And supplies have to go through passes like this. And when they go through passes like this, numerical superiority is nothing. Because if there are a hundred or a thousand people down in the valley, a dozen men with guns up on hilltops, it's a, I don't know, shooting fish in a barrel or something like that. So that's why it makes it so complicated and difficult. Some other paintings, and again, this was from the last Anglo-Afghan war. Again, you can look at paintings 200 years ago. You can look at images in... A hundred years ago, you will see the same kind of thing. The British tried everything, but could not defeat the Afghans. I'm sorry I'm going very fast um, because of the time. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful image. Remnants of an army. This person, he was a doctor. His name was Dr. Bryden. 14,000 of the most modern military in the world at that time was slaughtered on the way back from, from uh, Afghanistan. That fort is Jalalabad. The horse dies. This guy was, because he had a Bible in his helmet, and when he was hit by a sword, the Bible took most of the hit. His skull was broken. The horse died. He was almost dead. He survived. This shows the state of 14,000 of the most modern army in the world how they were slaughtered when they were trying to leave Afghanistan. And one person was let go. Why, then, knowing all this, why do empires go into a place like Afghanistan? Two words, arrogance and ignorance. When 9-11 happened after that, there'll be discussions, and then the whole Afghanistan thing started. I remember once I was in a discussion and I mentioned that that's going to be a bad idea, a problem, and this like that. Someone called the police on me. They're like, oh, he is one of them. Because he's saying that the Afghan war, this is a problem, because he's taking sides with them. Someone really called the police on me. And I was freaking out. Because I was like, I was like you never know. They, it was a crazy time right after 9-11. Um, and then now we saw what happened a few years later. That this is why they thought... Every time a military went into Afghanistan, they thought, we are more modern, we are better, we are more equipped, these guys cannot do anything, and they all failed. The British could not defeat, could not capture Afghanistan, so they decided to draw a line. It was called the Durand Line. And this became a border between Afghanistan and British India. They said, well, that's the only way we can kind of save face. And when this area was created, 
the tribes on the Indian side, which is now Pakistani side, they were called FATA, Federally Administered Tribal Areas. What does that mean? You are the tribesmen. Some tribes have 1,000 people. Some tribes have 100,000 people. Each of your tribe is ruled by a chief or a group of chiefs. So the, what the British did, they turned this area into tribal territories so that the area could be run, managed by a tribal council, which means the tribes are told that you are independent. Only then did they agree to this. And this setup has been there till now. So again, uh, this is the Pakistani side of tribes. This is a very recent image. Guns, weapons, and this is a peace gathering. So even if you go to a peace gathering, you take your gun with you. You never know. So, question, Taliban, Mujahideen, Taliban, Mujahideen, this, that. Who are they? I call them Taliban 1.0 and Taliban 2.0, to simplify things. Afghan Mujahideen, 1979 to 1989. These were the ones who were fighting against the Russians. Look at the images. Sometimes you see beards, but they are not religious beards. They are tribal beards. Many of them are, only have mustaches. Very important. Look at the way they are going to be looking at the cameras, proud, fighting. Um, this is some gun, uh, gun camera images from how the Russians were destroying villages. Um, Zbigniew Brzezinski. They started aiding Mujahideen. Mujahideen, these are the posters I grew up with. In the corner, it's Charlie Wilson. I grew up with the streets, uh, on the streets with images such as these in the 80s. These were supposed to be the good guys. Again, I grew up with these posters. The important thing is, this guy is protecting the holy shrine from the Russians. He has no beard. You know that a religious extremism concept wasn't there. Again, and that sword, in Arabic, it's written jihad. So jihad is the one which is being uh, used to save Afghanistan and the women and the men and all the kind of things. Propaganda posters. These gentlemen are the moral equivalent of America's founding fathers. That's, now remember, this is Mujahideen. These were the groups fighting the Russians. Rambo was there. Rambo III, terrible, terrible film. The film is dedicated to the brave Mujahideen fighters of Afghanistan. James Bond also went in there because these were supposed to be the good guys. Osama bin Laden, I'm sure you guys know this guy. So Anti-Soviet war puts his army on the road to peace. 1993, it's a British newspaper. Taliban 1.0. Mujahideen fight the Russians, the Russians leave, Mujahideen start fighting among themselves and creates civil war. And within that civil war, a group rises, and those are Taliban 1.0, 1996 to 2001. This was the group toppled by the US. That this is different than what we have today. These, this group, black turbans, Osama bin Laden also gets involved, but the most important thing that you have to see is the outfits. You're seeing black turbans, you're seeing more beards, the clothing is different. I can't go into too much detail because time is short or else I would have explained the, um, I, I call it the terrorist fashion. Of when I see someone, I can tell you where are they getting their influence from and from there I can. Um... So that was Taliban 1.0. Taliban 2.0 is 2001 till present. So when you say Taliban, you have to decide which Taliban. When Taliban 1.0 are toppled, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, the resistance rises, and those are Taliban 2.0. These are Taliban 2.0. See the images, different. The, the outfits, the clothing, all that stuff changed. And then there are two kinds of 2.0, Afghan Taliban and Pakistani Taliban. Then the good Taliban, and then the bad Taliban. So again, it keeps on getting confusion. And then. At one time in Pakistan, there were around 70 different groups who were all combined part of the Pakistani 2.0 Taliban. And they keep on changing, adding, you lose count. There are so many groups. Afghan National Army, Afghan National Police. So what 
does the army do? What does the police do? You have to understand, Afghan police was not, throughout history, was not there for policing. The tribes do that. Afghan police was created to collect taxes. So when you think about police, do not think that, oh, they are there to control. No. Yes, attempts have been made for that, but the logic behind Afghan police was collecting taxes for the central government. And then Afghan army, we, we know the situation, we know the cases, because any time someone is a member of an Afghan army, before that, he's, he is a member of a tribe. And tribal loyalties, are that's your blood. Army or police is not your blood. Um, I'll be quick. 1979-2001, can we make Afghanistan the way it was in the past, before the wars? 79, the war started um, against the Russians. 2001, the US go in. When all that happened, this, this thing, people in Afghanistan scattered all over the world. Societies of, within Afghanistan scattered. What was keeping Afghanistan the way it was Tribal codes. And tribal codes are customs and usages. And customs and usages with, with which we live are time and space specific. When you take a group of people who have lived somewhere for a thousand years and remove them and bring them back 50 years later to the same place, will those people have the same customs and usages with which they have lived for the last thousand years? No. So that will not happen. You can take all the Afghans, bring them back to the same region, to their hometowns, all that stuff. They will never have the same old Afghanistan that was there before 1979. In the end, I always say, when we think of Afghanistan, if you look at it as a problem, it will always be there. But the other side, when I tell people, before uh, 1979, People used to go on honeymoon to Afghanistan. Now, today, no one will believe it. Today, no one believes it. Like, how is that possible? When I was growing up, uh, there'll be buses full of the, the hippie movement and the tourists and stuff. You could drive from England all the way through Europe, Turkey, then Iran, and smoke funny stuff all throughout the, the, the path. Then Iran, then Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, and then end up on the beaches in Goa, created a new culture. All of this was happening through Afghanistan and Iran. Why? Because these places were very different than the way we see them today. So I'm sorry, I had to really go fast. I could not go into detail. So if you have any questions, please ask me. Okay, three hands raised. Yes. Okay, I speak Pashto. That's my mother tongue, and the kind of Pashto I speak is not written; it's just spoken. Um, and there are other dialects as well. Then I Urdu, uh, Punjabi, Hindi, Hindko, English. Are there six? Yeah, six. Right, six. Uh, one more somewhere in there. So it's always. So it depends, but it's not that big a deal. You have to understand, in a country like Pakistan or India. In many places, three languages are common. Yes, it seems that, whoa, six languages, big deal. No, because when you live among people where you have to use multiple languages every day, it's very easy. Okay, yes, sir. I, I'm, I, I am not the smartest person in the room. Uh, I always tell, we will have Afghanistan. We'll have this problem. The issue is that when things get so messed up when identities are lost. Gaining those identities back in a region like that, where relationships, customs and usages are all based on identities. When those are lost, it will never be restored. We have to set up a point in history which we try to achieve. Like, you know, like make Afghanistan great again, or something like that. But we have to say, you know what, I mean, at least you try. What you do 
is you say, well, Afghanistan in 1965 or Afghanistan in 1973 when the king was uh, removed. You take that mark and look at the crime rate and safety and security situation all over Afghanistan and use that as a goal. Then something is achievable. Other than that, no way. And I'm sorry, it's like sometimes when I am, uh, talk about war and conflict with other people, uh, someone would say, well, well, why can't we just live in peace and why can't we all be together? Well, we can't. There'll always be that small group of people, a small group, but which will have significant, significant impact on that area which will be creating problems. And that is as how it has always been. So I wish I could, but the only thing I can come across is take a point in history and try to achieve that rather than you thinking, uh, take democracy. Democracy is not an Afghan model. The voting, the, all that stuff, it doesn't work. Yes, it sounds good, but it's a foreign thing. It won't help. Yes, any other question? David, you had a question? Okay, when we, uh, Afghanistan, again, is not gonna be Middle East. It's gonna be South Asia. When we think about an average Muslim, and uh, an average American thinks Muslim, what's the first thing that comes to their mind? Arab. In reality, Arab is minority. Majority of the Muslims are in South and East Asia. So when you think about an average Muslim, it's either me, or someone from Indonesia or Malaysia, from those countries. Those are the majority Muslim. So that's why, and, and again, when we say Arab, all Arabs are not Muslims. They'll be Christian Arabs. So for example, think about it. When, I, when, when we, we talk about the Palestinian conflict, it seems to be a Jewish and Muslim issue. It's not. Uh, the suicide bombers, the aircraft hijacking, when it started, many of them, in fact, most of them, the ones who were members of PLO, were atheists. So they were not Muslims, but since they're part of PLO, the belief was they're Muslims. No, it is based on geography. So Arab is completely different. South Asia is completely different. Let me give an example on that. In 1919, there was a fatwa all over South Asia in India, which declared the house of the Saud as heretics in 1919. Because why? Because South Asia had more Persian and Turkish influence, not Arab influence. But now things have mixed up, but that's a totally different topic. I mean, and I, I don't want to go into detail because it just opens up a Pandora's box. Yes, any other question? Okay, the, the reason, the good and bad is, in the, in the news media when we see good and bad. So from a US perspective, if someone agrees with US policies, for the US, they'll be good Taliban. If they disagree, they'll be bad Taliban. But in the beginning, as I mentioned, there are so many players in there, each of them have their own uh, distinction of good and bad. And they're all separate. And that's why there's confusion. So, for example, a good, good Taliban for the US may be bad Taliban for Pakistan or bad Taliban for Iran. And you also have to understand, a group like this cannot survive, these different Taliban groups. All of them, all of them have support by the government from one government or another government. So this, it's on their own, they cannot survive because Afghanistan is in the middle. There are Arab Taliban, Pakistani Taliban, Indian Taliban, Central Asian Taliban, Emirati Taliban. It's, it's a very, very complicated mix. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, positive. Uh, education access has increased. 
security has gone down. Uh, lots of people got very rich quick. Um, and most of that money is outside Afghanistan, um, based in Dubai and all those places. That's how the money uh, went through and was pulled out. Um, a war economy was created. So in the beginning, things seemed proper. Because the, for the first time in the history of Afghanistan, the local people actually welcomed a foreign invading force because so that they could get rid of the Taliban, 1.0. The problem was that economy that started over there was a war economy, which means it wasn't a stable local economy. So if we want to say, I mean, I don't want to sound all negative, positive, positive things have happened. But when you look at the bigger picture, the amount of uh, people that, or the number of people that die every day in Afghanistan, it is way more than they were between 1996 and 2001. So it depends how you look at um, positive, that kind of thing. And I'm sorry, it's, I wish I could say like, yes, everything is perfect, but I can't. That's the problem. Yes, sir. I love odd questions. Uh -huh. Wahan, Wahan, that's that small, uh, which, separ which separated uh, USSR from Pakistan also. It's in that narrow stretch. I'm, I'm just so surprised that we're not talking about this thing about the other It is, it is uh, again, it is about the culture. It has been that way throughout um, for a very long time. And you'll be amazed, there, there was, I was once reading about the people who lived there on that Wahan uh, strip. I think it's 80 miles wide. I think that's that stretch. Um, people over there, when they were asked, did not know about 9-11 or the war actually taking place in Afghanistan. That area is so remote. You also have to understand, in the end, one thing, because I, I have covered wars and conflicts for a long time, when someone asks me, like, how come wars are fought in the most beautiful of places? Now, Wahan is beautiful, but it's difficult. Because wars can be fought in beautiful places. What is a beautiful place? Green, water, animals, um, crops. You would have never heard of a war which was fought in Antarctica. Because you can't fight a war in Antarctica. That's the reason we fought throughout history in places where large groups of people can survive. So many a times, geography saves you. Because you are in a place no one wants to deal with you, and you live in peace. So that's the problem. So if it's beautiful, some, someone must have sometime fought over it. Thank you very much. Thank you.